Hello and welcome to a new episode of Adobe Creative Cloud TV. My name is Terry White and in this episode we're going to take a look at how to get started with Photoshop CC, 10 things beginners want to know how to do. Now it's a difficult topic only from the standpoint of there's so much to Photoshop and as a beginner you can easily be overwhelmed with so many different options and so many different things you can do. So that's why I'm putting this video together to narrow down and quickly get you started on the 10 things people ask the most, what they want to learn how to do the most. Now there's some ground rules and some setup information first. So first rule, if you're a Photoshop Pro expert, been using Photoshop for 20 years, probably not your video. You should go on and watch other things, go do other things. If you are a Photoshop user, but maybe not an expert, you've just been using Photoshop for a while, you might run into a situation where I'm showing something and you say, hey, I do it differently. I do X, Y, and Z instead of A, B, and C. And that's fine. Photoshop has infinite possibilities and dozens, if not hundreds of ways of doing certain things. So if you do it a different way, then do it your way if you're more comfortable. I can't show you every single way I even know how to do things. So I'm going to show you quick ways of doing things that may not be the way you're doing it, but if you're doing it a way that you like, by all means, keep doing it your way. And um, last but not least, you'll see me from time to time pick up my stylus and work. I'm actually working on a large uh, Cintiq monitor here that is right below the camera, and I'll actually be working right on the monitor itself. Um, now, many of you are using a mouse, a trackpad, a trackball, and those all work with Photoshop, but you're missing out. Even if you don't have a Cintiq, I highly recommend you go grab a Wacom tablet. Now, ta graphics tablets plug in via your USB port, Mac, Windows, whatever it is, and you can actually write on the tablet and it will show what you're doing in Photoshop. The difference is your mouse is either up or down. It's on or off. This has pressure sensitivity thousands of levels of pressure. So the harder I press down, the bigger a brush I get, or the more of the effect I'll get. The less I press down, the less I'll get. So I can make more minute, finite adjustments with this tool, uh, as opposed to using a mouse. So Wacom has tablets that start at, I don't know, 60, 70 bucks, and their cheapest tablet is better than your most expensive mouse. So I highly recommend you go out and get a Wacom tablet. I don't care which one you get. Just get one as opposed to using a mouse. It'll make your Photoshop work so much better. So with that, uh, now that we set the ground rules, we kind of saw the hardware that I'm going to be working with. I'm on a Mac. If you're on a PC, that's fine. I'll give both keyboard shortcuts where they apply. Let's go ahead and jump right in. The first thing is that as a CC member, you probably use the Creative Cloud app to download and install Photoshop. And that's great. Just make sure you're on the latest version. Uh, that it's up to date, and that will be the version I'm working on currently. And uh, the next thing you want to do is, uh, optionally, Bridge is an install now. You can go ahead and install Bridge separately, whereas it used to install automatically with Photoshop. Now, Bridge is not absolutely necessary for Photoshop use, but um, whether you're a uh, Bridge user or a Lightroom user, it helps to have another tool to be able to preview your images and see your images larger before you actually open them up in Photoshop. So since most of you are beginners, we'll start with Bridge. If you are a photographer, chances are you're working with Lightroom. That's great too. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's what I use most of the time. You can use them both. You can have them both side by side installed. You can use either one for whichever task is better. Now, if you don't have Bridge installed, then you can scroll down to the bottom of the list. It will be listed as one of your new apps to be able to find. Uh, just if this were Bridge, you'd click the install button and it would download and install it right on your computer. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at these this folder. Now, this folder is the folder of images I'm going to be working on. And again, just like anything else, there are dozens of ways to get your images in your computer. You can plug in a memory card and copy them over to a folder that way. You can plug in your camera and download them that way. Bridge even, even has a photo downloader in it. You can scan them. You can grab them from the web. Some of my images are stock photography, so we'll sh um, I grab them from iStockPhoto.com. So lots of ways of getting your images into your computer. And whatever way works best for you, um, most likely if it's a JPEG or a Photoshop file or TIFF, Photoshop can open it directly. So with that, I'm going to take this whole folder and drag it right on top of the bridge icon because I want to look at the images first. So Bridge gives me this nice little preview. I can click on an image, hit the space bar, it goes full screen. I can uh, toggle over to the next image using the arrow keys. I can hit escape to get back. I can make my thumbnails smaller. 
make my thumbnails bigger. This is why I like Bridge or Lightroom to kind of see what I'm going to work on first. Now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and open up our first image, uh, which is image number one in this case. It will launch Photoshop. It will, uh, once Photoshop is up, it will open Photoshop or open the image in Photoshop. And now at this point, I can use my magnifying tool to either click to zoom in, hold down my option key to zoom out or alt key on Windows or drag and dynamically zoom. Uh, that's a little close. Let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. All right, so now we have this, uh, this little girl here who has some pimples and blemishes. And the thing about, um, the number one thing that people wanna know how to do is touch up a photo or make a photo look better. And when we look at a person's face, when someone's standing in front of you, you're not staring at them. You're not saying, okay, I see a pimple there, I see a mark there, you're, you're just casually glancing at them. And that's the thing, we don't notice a lot of things on people because we're not staring at them. But when it's a photo, you're looking at that person in HD, full resolution, and you're, you get to see every little thing because they're not moving and you get to stare. Well, we wanna be fair to this person and take away the things that we probably wouldn't see, the things that are temporarily, the things that we probably wouldn't notice if the person was standing in front of us. And the best tool for that, that I'm gonna start with, is the Spot Healing Tool. Spot Healing Brush Tool. So I grab the Spot Healing Brush Tool, it looks like a Band-Aid, and you'll notice that it comes in on Photoshop in the shape of a circle. Now, because I have a tablet, I'm gonna use the little wheel here and just dial the size of the brush up and down, one of the advantages. However, if you didn't have a tablet, you could use the bracket keys on your keyboard. Uh, the ones next to the letter P on a US keyboard will make the brush bigger or smaller. You don't have bracket keys for whatever reason, just go to the brush uh, option here and you can drag the little slider left and right to make your brushes bigger or smaller. All right, so now we're just gonna go ahead and paint that blemish away. And that's the beauty of this tool is that it uses the surrounding pixels to kind of blend in the area that you're clicking on if you're using a mouse or painting if you're using a stylus to kind of get rid of these things uh, that are on her face that again, if she was standing there, we wouldn't be staring at or paying so much attention to. And uh, because she was frozen in time, we've got all these things to kind of take care of. And just in a few clicks, a few little paint dabs there, here and there, and we're just dabbing the brush. And again, I have pressure sensitivity from the stylus, so I can do a little bit or a lot by how hard I press down. We can kind of clean this up pretty quickly and pretty easily in Photoshop CC. All right. Once we're there, we kind of finished number one, that's it. How to remove blemishes, the spot healing tool is my tool of choice, there are other tools to do it with. Um, but while we're at it, we'll just divert for a second, go to our filter menu, this is not one of the 10 things, but it's kind of fun. We'll grab liquify and we'll just, you know, we took some of our blemishes away, we'll make her smile a little bit. There we go. Just by turning up that frown, making it a smile. That's just playing around in Photoshop CC. All right, that wasn't part of the 10 things, but it was fun. Next, let's close this image. I'm not gonna save any of these because I'll use them again to show other people. And now I wanna get back to Bridge. I wanna get back to the second image to work on. Well, I could switch back over to Bridge because it's an application running in the background, or I can use this panel down in the lower left-hand corner, Mini Bridge. If I click on Mini Bridge and bring it up, it will go to the last folder I was in, which is in this case, the same folder, or I could navigate to whatever folder I wanted to go to on my computer, on my hard drive, wherever I want to get to it. Now that I'm in that folder, I can actually just double click to get to my next image without having to go back and forth between bridge. So mini bridge talks to bridge running in the background and lets it go ahead and grab images without having to switch back and forth. All right, so our next image, uh, we're gonna talk about number two, which is layers slash adjustment layers. So that's kind of a two part. So the first thing is what's a layer? You notice in your layers panel, you always will have at least one layer or the background and the background is usually a flat image of the photo. So it's the background. Um, I can turn the background on and off, but um, and no, actually I can't turn the background on and off because it's the background. But if there were other layers, I could turn them on and off and see what's there. So what's a layer? Let's add one. Let's click the little uh, create layer icon and that one I can turn on and off because it's a layer. But anyway, now that I've got this turned on, 
What is it? Layer number one. Imagine if your photo were on your table, this uh, football player, and you put a clear piece of acetate or plastic on top of it, and then you started writing on the plastic with a magic marker. That is the same thing as a layer. It wouldn't affect the photo underneath. That paint or that mark would only go on top of the plastic. So I just put a clear piece of acetate digitally on top of him. So now if I grab my paintbrush tool, and I'm in this blue paint here, and I just start painting. Oh no, you're messing up the photo. Well, because I was on a layer, if I turn that layer off, turn that layer on, we just see the paint. It didn't affect anything else underneath. Matter of fact, I can even go to my eraser tool. And here we can make our brush bigger on the eraser. And we can start erasing the paint. And it will not erase the photo underneath. Because the photo is protected because I'm not working on the background. I'm on the actual layer above. We can double click. We can name that layer so that we know what it is. It's the paint layer. We can turn that layer on and off at any given time. We can put anything we want on that layer. We can put another image on that layer. We can do anything we want. We can have as many layers as we want. So I can add another layer and add another layer and another layer and turn them on and off as I need. So layers are the clear pieces of acetate that let you work kind of non-destructively on an image without having to actually edit the pixels below. So I'm gonna delete this layer. It was just a, a test and just drag it to the trash can to get rid of it. And now we're back to our original photo. Now the next kind of layer is an adjustment layer. You have all kinds of adjustments up here above the layers panel, and we want to lighten up his face. Matter of fact, one of my photographers was looking at this photo in my portfolio. She liked the rim lighting that I did on the sides, but she thought, well, you know, the face wasn't, it was a little dark, you know, for her taste. And once I looked at it, I agree. Let's make the photo, let's make his face a little bit lighter. So luckily there's a nice exposure adjustment. When I click exposure, it adds the exposure adjustment layer, and I can then just go ahead and dial up the exposure. But wait, Terry, you're adjusting the exposure for everything. The rest of the photo was fine. I just wanted to adjust the face. So um, that's the problem. The adjustment layer by default is everything or nothing. So in this case, you notice next to the actual adjustment, there is this white rectangle, which is called a layer mask. So um, this is actually number three, working with masks. So the mask is by default not covering anything. So everything's fair game. If I wanted to um, mask out that adjustment on part of the photo, I could grab my paintbrush, paint in the opposite color, which is black in this case. And I can say, no, 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 don't lighten this stuff down here. And it, you know, it looks like it's painting black, but it's actually painting just the mask. That's how dark it used to be. And I could keep doing this, but that would take a while to get it all back to the way it used to be. So let's undo that, undo that. Let's get rid of that. And instead, let's go in and revert the, or flip the mask over. Let's invert it. So go up to our image menu, adjustments, invert. So in other words, use the mask to hide all the exposure. So now it's like it's back to the way it was. Nothing is brightened anymore. And instead of having to paint the whole thing black just to leave the face white, I'm going to do the opposite. The whole thing now is black and I'm gonna switch colors by toggling the little arrows here to white and just expose the face. So that's the point of the mask. The mask covered that adjustment on the rest of the photo and I can just lighten this area. And if it's too bright, dial it down because you still have the adjustment itself that is now being masked to only apply to the area outside or that we just punched a hole in the mask for. I want the helmet? No problem. Just paint. And by the way, I was using the mouse. Let's go back to the stylus. There we go. Much easier. And we can go ahead and paint that all in so we can brighten up the helmet. And again, both of those have now, those holes have been cut in the mask itself. If you were to look at the mask, that's what it looks like. And we can go ahead and again, dial it up, dial it down, and it's adjusting both his face and the helmet. If I wanted to just adjust the face and the helmet separately, I would have created another adjustment layer and done the helmet separately. So you can make as many adjustments as you want. 
Now you might say, or oh, here, let's turn this one off for a second. Let's have a little fun. Let's go into our um, black and white adjustment layer and click. And that black and white adjustment layer did as you would expect. It made the photo black and white. We can go ahead and play with the black and white uh, using the original colors of the photo as our guide, but it's black and white. So what if I wanted to bring back some of the color in some of the areas? Same technique. We grab our paintbrush, we switch back to black, and if I paint over this part, it brings back in the red. If I paint over this, it starts bringing back in the blue and the shoulder pads. So that's how people do, that's one of the ways people can do those uh, photos you see that are black and white with just the highlight of color in certain areas. So that's what adjustment layers do. I can turn that one off, turn this one back on, leave them both on. Uh, it's up to me to do control this any way that I want. So adjustment layers, working with masks, number two, number three. So what's number four? Let's close this image and switch back to mini bridge and let's grab this one. Number four, believe it or not, the thing that people want to know how to do the most is crop a photo. Now we have uh, the, a new cropping tool, a cropping tool that's been advanced over the last couple of versions of Photoshop. When I grab the crop tool, first thing you'll notice if you haven't used Photoshop before or haven't used it in a while, you get these nice handles around the image. So the sky really isn't very interesting. I can go ahead and just pull this down. Now it's remembering the original ratio of the photo. So let me undo that for a moment and let's switch it to just ratio and let's clear it out. So now what this allows me to do is um, adjust the crop any way that I want. So ratio versus original ratio allows me to choose which way that I want to crop this. So I just want to crop out the sky, kind of keeping everything else. So now um, the other thing you'll notice is that there's a choice for delete cropped pixels. If that is checked, that's saying throw away that sky, throw away the rest that you got rid of. If it's unchecked, that means that when I click OK, the sky goes away, but the pixels are still in the image. If I ever go back to the crop tool, I can always uncrop and bring the sky back. So that's why I usually work with that unchecked in case I decide to change my mind. Now in this world or this age of uh, Instagram and posting photos online, some photos need to be square like your profile picture on um, Facebook. It tends to like it to be square or Instagram photos are square. So you can do these crops or you could do a ratio that is one to one or eight by 10 or five by seven or four by six, so forth and so on. So if I say one by one square, it will square up this photo. Now, of course, it's cropping off part of the car, no problem. Pick it up, move it over. So I can crop just the part that I want and now it's a perfect square. So if I post this to Instagram, I'm not gonna lose any part of the photo. So just a side note that you can do the original ratio, any ratio you want, or, um, and we wanna clear it so it's not square, or square or whatever other ratio you need. All right, so we got it cropped. That was number four. The next one is number five, fixing this particular photo's exposure and color cast problems. Now, there are all kinds of ways to do this in Photoshop. Uh, in the past, we would have used levels and curves and all kinds of ways. But to, in today's modern Photoshop world, I tend to like to use Camera Raw whenever I can. Luckily for Photoshop CC users, Camera Raw is now a filter. So it can be used the way it always was, but now it can be added to the image, any layer, any format as a filter. So for example, we've got this layer here and I wanna make it non-destructive so that when I, whatever I do in Camera Raw or the filter menu, I can always come back and make changes. Otherwise, if you apply a filter just as is, you're actually affecting the pixels. So to make it non-destructive, I'm gonna say convert for smart filters first. It's just a one-time thing. Now the layer will have this little square icon on it, denoting that it's a smart object. Now that I've done that, I can go to the filter menu and I can come down to the brand new camera raw filter in Photoshop CC, and that will open up. Now again, remember the rest of the sky is still there. Don't worry about that, it will be cropped out. But now I can fix the white balance using a single eyedropper. Now what I'm looking for is something in the photo that's around 18% gray, white or black. 
Now the rims look gray, but they're probably lighter than 18%. So the car is black, I can just click, and that will fix the color cast of the car. It's no longer blue, the image is no longer too blue. It is still washed out and bad, but it's no longer too blue. So let's fix some of the other things. Uh, let's bring down the exposure. And how about, uh, let's pump up the blacks a little bit, give a little bit more definition in this photo. We can increase the contrast and we can scroll down here and we can maybe pump up the saturation and since it is a landscape and not a person, maybe pump up the vibrance and the clarity. So saturation is a little too much there. We can pull that back. Uh, we can work on the shadows, darken up the shadows a bit and bring down the whites in this photo. Kind of just bring this photo back into something a little bit more what we saw out there in the desert. All right, so now that I've got that, and again, that might be a little too much in the blacks. There we go. I can click OK. And here's my before. Oops. <laughs> here's my before and my after. Just with those adjustments using sliders in Camera Raw. That's why I like Camera Raw so much. And because we made it a smart object first, if I ever want to get back to those adjustments, I can double click on this Camera Raw filter get right back to where I was and continue to make adjustments. So if the blacks are still too much, pull them back up a little bit, click OK. It will reprocess, we're back to the image. So that is number five, adjusting the exposure and using the Adobe Camera Raw filter in Photoshop CC. Okay, so next, let's close this image and let's uh, go back to Mini Bridge. And the next one we're gonna do is removing something from an image. That's a num another one of those top 10 things. So I took this photo out in Las Vegas and I liked, it was a production shot on purpose, you know, use, photographing the lighting equipment, but I liked it so much that I wished it were the real shot. Well, what would make it the real shot? If the lighting equipment wasn't there. So now what I need to do is tell Photoshop because I don't have the lighting equipment on its own layer, it's just the background. I need to tell Photoshop to get rid of this light. To do that, I need to, to select it first. Photoshop is all about selecting things if you want to isolate or affect certain things. So I, the way to remember it is, you must select to affect. If you want to affect some, one specific thing, select it first. So how do I select the light? Well, there are lots of ways to do it. In this case, since I want the light and a little bit of the surrounding area around it, I'm going to use the lasso and do it manually. There are all kinds of selection tools. You know, Photoshop is probably half selection tools of all the tools. But all kinds of selection tools this time, again, using the stylist, we're just going to go ahead and quickly, roughly, not having to be totally accurate, make a real quick selection around the light stand and the leg sticking out there and the backpack holding it down. It was a windy day. And there we go. Back up the light stand, back around the speed light, and voila. Now that area is selected. So I've told Photoshop only worry about this area. Now I want to tell Photoshop to fill that area in using the content aware fill option, which is use the surrounding area, similar to the healing brush. So to do that, the keyboard shortcut for it is delete as long as you're on a background. If you were on a layer, it'd be shift delete. But because I'm on the background, I hit delete. First time I showed this in Photoshop CS5, I had uh, hundreds of comments. Hey, I don't have a delete key. My delete key didn't work. My, my keyboard doesn't have that key. What do I do? I'm on a PC. So, okay, I get it. Not all keyboards <laughs> have that key. So if you don't have that key, go up to your edit menu, simply come down to fill. It does the same thing. So the delete key is the keyboard shortcut, but if you don't have that key for whatever reason on your keyboard, just go up to edit and fill and make sure you're on content aware, click okay. And what Photoshop will now do is analyze that select selection using the pixels around that selection. It will then go ahead and fill in that selection with it, like so. Now, while that area is selected, I can't do anything outside of that area. Even if I grab my paintbrush, which is on blue paint, and I'm not on the layer, I can't paint. I can't do anything. I'm painting because I'm outside this area. I can paint in there all day long, but not inside that area, outside that area. 
So how do I tell Photoshop I'm done with this area? You deselect. So go to your select menu, choose deselect. I do it from the keyboard most often, Command D on Mac, Control D on Windows. That will deselect and show you what you have left, which in this case is a nice photo without the light. So that is uh, how to remove an object from a photo, number six. Number seven, let's close this. Go to the uh, images here. Let's open up our next one. And uh, what we're going to do here is zoom this one up a little bit. And just to show you the content aware fill option works on all kinds of things. I'm going to do it again, this time on a person instead of a light. And this time I'm going to use a different selection method. Last time I used the lasso. This time I'm going to use the one right below it, which is quick select. Now, if you're on the magic wand, you'll notice that two, tool, two or more tools can occupy the same spot. So quick select, if it has a little arrow down in the lower right hand corner, that means there are more tools underneath. So quick select is the one that looks like a brush with a selection. And the reason for quick select is that it is quick, not necessarily accurate, just quick. And now that we have this selection made, I want to make sure we get the hair. There we go. And we can keep selecting making sure we don't miss anything because we kind of walk through your photo. Now, in this case, it grabbed a little too much. Grab the area between uh, her legs. So we're going to go ahead, hold on the Option key on Mac or Alt key on Windows to deselect. So we can do the same thing under the arms if we didn't need the stuff under the arms. Now, it won't really matter in this case, but I just wanted to point out that that's how you would deselect uh, if, if uh, Quick Select grabbed too much. Okay, so now we got it nice and selected. Just like with the light stand, I want to grab more than what we have selected. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to expand our selection. Select, modify, expand. Now, how, how much? I don't know. I, it, it's your guess. I don't know how much it needs until I see it. And I can't tell by typing in a number because the number is based on the resolution of the photo. So I could type in 8 on one photo, it would be perfect. And on the next photo, it might not be enough. So I'm going to start with 10. So let's go ahead and click OK. And that increased it by 10 pixels based on this resolution. That should just about do it. That's the amount of space I want around this. Now, again, we'll hit Delete, bring up Content Aware Fill, or just go Edit Fill. Click OK, and that will remove the photo. So that's Deselect. Not bad. Now let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. And I'm going to undo it. I'm going to undo it twice or three times. Let's do undo by step backwards. Undo again by step backward one more time. And so twice. And now that I've got the image back, instead of deleting it, we're going to do number seven, which is move it. I want to move this person over to the right. Now, obviously, if I just pick her up and move her, then it's going to leave a hole. And that's what we want. So what we're going to do is we're not going to use the move tool we're going to use a, new, a fairly new tool in Photoshop called Content Aware Move. So if I use Content Aware Move, what that will do is I can pick her up. It looks like it's making a copy. It is until I let go. When I let go, it will do Content Aware Fill on the old one and now move the new one in place, and then I just deselect. So that is Content Aware Move uh, on a tool, the Content Aware Move tool. All right, so now that I've moved them further apart, it's not fair that she's holding a leaf or leaves and the other person isn't. So let's uh, digress for a moment. Let's grab the quick select tool. Let's go ahead and select the leaves that this person's holding and let's put them on their own layer. So let's go to our layer menu, new layer via copy or command J, which is the way I do it most times. Now that, that we got the leaves on their own layer, we can't really see what they look like until we move them. So let's use the move tool and we can move them around. We can pick them up, move them anywhere we want because they're on their own layer. They're on their own clear piece of acetate. Now we can just put it next to her hand, make it look like she's holding that set. But then it kind of looks a little fake here because they're both exactly carrying the same amount of leaves that look exactly the same. Not likely. So in this case, we're going to do free transform, edit, free transform, which will take that selected layer that we're on and lets us, lets us do things to it. So for example, I can hold down my shift key 
and scale it down. Let's make them smaller. I could rotate them. I could right click and do other things like skew them or distort them or flip them horizontally. And again, we can rotate, kind of make it look different, make it look like it's not so much the exact same leaf that the other person's holding. All right, once I'm happy, I click the check mark, which is okay. I can even use the eraser tool because I'm on a layer. Let's make our brush smaller. And I can go in and erase part of the leaf um, so that, again, it doesn't look so identical to the other one. Okay, make it, yeah, I even chopped it off a little bit. That's fine. Leaves are damaged sometimes. Okay, so there you go. We duplicated, we moved, we made a new layer, we copied a layer, all the kinds of things basically in moving an object. Okay, next, and this is the big one. This is the one that's going to take us home because this is the one that people ask for the most. Our last couple of images here. This one and this one. Let's select both of them with use the shift key, hit enter to open both of them, then close mini bridge. And now we have two images open. So we have this one and we have this one. Now I want to put, if you're not guessed yet, I want to take this photo and put it on this background. So the question always comes up, how do I remove a photo from the background? Well, that's usually because they want to put it on a different background. So we're going to kind of do it backwards. First thing we're going to do is take this photo using the move tool. We're going to move it up to this tab. So the other photo comes in front and drag it down into this photo. Don't let go until you drag it down. Now when you drag it down, you might start getting warnings like this. Hey, your photos have a bit different bit depth because that was 16 bit and this is eight. The results may vary. Click OK, no problem. Hey, your photo that you're bringing it on was Pro Photo RGB versus Adobe RGB. No problem, click OK. It's just telling you that if you're a color expert or you're a color person that says, hey, you don't wanna mix things up, you're, you're mixing things up and that's fine for this, it's fine. So now the photo also came in too big. It came in much bigger than the original background. So we're going to do edit, free transform, just like we did before. And we can't even see the handles. They're so far off the canvas. No problem. Um, we're going to hit our command on Mac, control on PC, zero. That will uh, do a fit in window so we can fit the whole thing. And now we're going to hold down our shift key so that we scale proportionally. I'm just going to bring this down. And we're going to bring it down to a size that kind of looks like it would be realistic if she were jumping in that room. Now, I'm cutting off part of the top. I'm going to bring the whole image down just for now. And we'll bring it back up later. All right, so now that I've got it sized, we'll go ahead and click the check mark. And now we can zoom in a little bit. I'm just using Command Plus, by the way, to zoom in. And we're done. No, we're not. We're not done because obviously the background she was originally on is quite different than the background we want to put her on. So let's fix it. Let's first of all select her using quick select. So using my quick select, making my brush a little bit bigger, we're going to go ahead and quickly select her. And again, this is one of those. Make sure you don't leave anything out like the soles of her shoes and the arms that, you know, because it stopped at the black. It didn't know you wanted the rest. I said it was quick select, not smart select, or accurate select, it is quick select. And we'll get as much of the hair as we can, knowing that hair is a problem. All right, <laughs> and the problem is she has hair. Okay, uh, make sure we get all the shoe over here. I was going to miss part of that. Make sure we don't leave anything out. And just kind of walk your way around the image. Make sure you didn't select uh, something you didn't want. And make sure you didn't leave something out. Okay, so now that I've made that selection. If I were to just cut out the background or inverse the selection and cut, we would have a very hard edge. Looks like you cut it with a pair of scissors look. And that would look very unprofessional. Instead, Photoshop's got a great tool to make this look better. And it's right here. It's called Refine Edge. Refine Edge becomes available anytime you have a selection. So we made a selection. With quick select, therefore we have refine edge. So when I click refine edge, that will bring up this dialog box. Now normally it's probably on white, so you'd probably see that. You see what your image looks like if you were had it on a white background. 
You could see it on a black background. You could see it on a red overlay. You could see it on uh, as a mask. And more importantly, you can see it on layers. So I can see what it looks like against my new background. Once I got it on layers, I can click out of this anywhere I want. And you'll notice that the hair, if you were to zoom in, is really hard edged right now. So we're gonna turn on Smart Radius, which knows the difference between hard and soft edges. And it will soften up the hair, but keep the rest of the body um, nice and sharp. Okay, so the next thing is the hair, because it's hair, picked up part of the original gray background, because I can see it right there, see it right there, see it right there, see it inter interspersed throughout the hair. So luckily, you're on the Refine Radius tool. And we're gonna make our brush a little bit bigger. And with the Refine Radius tool, we're just gonna start painting where the old background used to be, so out here. It's painting gray, and we're just gonna paint all the hair that it was leaving gray that we don't want. And what this will do is say, this is the color I don't want in this hair. Remove it the minute you let go. That's what Refine Radius does. So it takes the color you were painting over the area you painted it on and says, take that color away. Make that look transparent. Now, you're not done. We're gonna decontaminate the colors, which says basically, take some of that white or gray reflection off the subject, off the hair. Next one we're gonna do is do a shift edge. We can kind of tighten up this a little bit more to make that hair look even more naturally against that other background. And I know what you're thinking, this is cheating. This is, you You use a white background, use a gray background. Oh my God, that's so easy. So does this work on other colors? If the color had been gray, I mean, I'm sorry, purple, yellow, green, plaid, whatever. Yes, as long as the subject you're removing is not the exact same color as the background you're removing them from. So if this, if she were wearing this black jumpsuit on a black background, no, it wouldn't work so good because it's a computer. It can't figure out what's a person and what's not a person. Your eye can, but it can't. So when you say it's not fair, you're cheating, it's too easy. Yeah, I shot it that way on purpose. So it would be easy. If you don't have that luxury, just make sure the subject's not in the same color background as what they're wearing or what they look like. So yes, it's easy. No, it doesn't have to be a perfectly white or gray or blue or whatever background. Yes, it works easier if it's a perfect background, but even if it didn't, as long as it's not the same color as the subject, you should be fine. Okay, last but not least, we're gonna say, instead of a new layer and mask, we're just gonna say new layer and click okay. So now that made a new layer, here's the original with the original, and now we have her on a new layer that we can now use the move tool and pick her up, move her anywhere we want, because she blends in nicely with that um, new background. So we can move her back up near the top here. Let's get to the top. Now, let's zoom out a little bit. What would make this look more realistic? Well, if she were really jumping in the air, there'd be something on the ground. There'd be some kind of shadow. So let's take care of that. So we're gonna call this layer uh, Candace, and we're gonna duplicate it. So how do we duplicate this layer? One way is to simply drag it to the new layer icon, which will tell it to make a copy. We're gonna take the copy, and we're gonna call it Shadow. Okay, and we're gonna put the shadow layer below the Candace layer. Okay, so now that we got the shadow layer, we can use the Move tool and move it out. So that's just the shadow layer. Notice it's underneath her. And that's fine. We're gonna move it out temporarily so we can see it, and we're gonna change it. So the first thing we're gonna change is a shadow is not a reflection, it's not the person. So we wanna make it completely black. One of the ways to do that, image, adjustment, levels, and we're just gonna crank down the levels all the way to where she's completely a silhouette. Click okay. Now your shadow is also not, usually not perfectly sharp. <laughs> it's usually blurred. So filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. And this way, I can crank it down or up to be as blurred as I need it to be. A little bit more, maybe something like that. Your choice. Click OK. Last but not least, your shadow is now 100% opaque. So each layer has opacity. We can just simply dial down the amount of opacity we want to make that look a little bit more realistic. Now that we got the shadow kind of looking look the way we want, we can pick it up, oh, shadow moving around. We can move it around, put it where we want, 
But again, it wouldn't be a perfect shape directly below her like that. So let's use free transform once again and squish it down and squish it up and make it look like a shadow that would be on the ground and against the wall if this were in real life. And we're gonna pick it up, move it over just that much. Click okay, because it's on its own layer, we can always turn the shadow on, turn it off, lower the opacity some more, adjust it any way we want, anytime we want, because it's on its own layer. Okay, so that is number eight, putting two photos together. Number nine, adding text. Now I could grab my type tool, and once I have my type tool, I can click on this photo and I can add text to it. I get my cursor, I'm gonna just start typing. But what if I wanna use a different font? So let's escape out of that for a minute. And because you're a Creative Cloud member, if you're a full Creative Cloud member, that means you've got access to more fonts. You've got access to a library over $20,000 in Typekit desktop fonts. So how do we get to those fonts? Type menu, or I'm sorry, your um, Creative Cloud menu for the app, go to the Fonts tab, and say Browse Typekit Fonts. That will take you out to your web browser. It will take you online to the Typekit library. And once you're in the Typekit library, you can find in any category of font you want um, by scrolling. You can uh, search by the style of the font. So if I want something decorative, I can grab the decorative ones. And we're gonna type uh, underneath this kind of strong push image. So let's say that we want to use uh, just for the sake of example, we use muscle. Uh, now again, let's see if I want anything else. Well, let's try load more fonts. Let's see if there's something else. I'll use muscle if I don't like anything else. Um, so picky. How about... Oh, this is tough. So many choices and I'm so picky. Let's do... We'll do muscle wide. Actually, muscle narrow. So when I say use fonts... I can go ahead and uh, sync selected fonts. And basically it's telling me to launch the Creative Cloud app, which I don't need to because it's already running. But that will take me over to the Creative Cloud app and it says uh, there were 36 fonts synced. And uh, if I scroll down, what was the name of that one? Muscle, Muscle Narrow is now there, it's been synced. So that means it is now in my computer. I can use it in any app. And if I click my type tool, and I click on this uh, um, image, I can scroll down my font list, and even without having to st restart Photoshop, I should have, if we go down here, I should have muscle, where are you? There we go, muscle uh, font. And we're just gonna type push in the muscle font. Now, that came in in the purple color that I was last using. I can go ahead and click on that purple color and grab any color that I want, any color in the spectrum. I can make it white if I want, do anything that I wanna do, including uh, grab, if I move outside the color spectrum, I can go ahead and click on the image and grab the gray that was already in her uh, push logo. So we click okay, and that will give us our text. We can go ahead and expand that out a little bit using option and right arrow key. And then we can pick this up because it is a layer and put it anywhere we want. So if I wanna put it over here, put it over here, do whatever I want, whatever looks good. So that is adding text to your Photoshop image. Just click your type tool, click. You can even go out and get new fonts that you didn't have if you're a full Creative Cloud member or use any font you have. And that is adding text to your photo. So last but not least, let's go ahead and bring it home. Number 10, saving your photos and saving them in a format that you can share. So first thing is, I wanna be able to always get back to all these layers and work on this. So we're gonna do save as, and we're just gonna call this one um, push, or we'll do KL push composite. Composite, there we go. And save it out. Okay, so now I've saved a Photoshop document that I can always open up. It will always have my layers. I can always come back in, change the text, change the um, um, where this is, move this around, make changes, do whatever I wanna do. However, if I want to uh, work on this 
where I, uh, if I want to give this to someone, then I don't want to give them a PSD. Chances are they don't have Photoshop and can't open it. What I want to give them instead is a JPEG or some other format that's easy to share. So let's say I want to post this online. I would do save for web or I could, um, I'm save for web or I could just do a save as, but if I do save for web, what this will do is narrow this or, or save this in an optimized way where my image will be as small as it can be. So now it came in huge. It's 2554 by 2500. So big that I can't even see it all. So I can take the longest dimension and drop it down. Let's say I want to drop it down to 800. So that makes it so I can see it now. It's 800 pixels wide and at JPEG medium quality, it's only going to be 54 K. If I want to be higher quality, I can do JPEG high. It'll be double the size, but still reasonable for the web. So I can go ahead and say, or email or Facebook or whatever you want. So now I'll go ahead and save this and we'll go ahead and save it to the desktop. And that's it. We've learned 10 things for beginners. We've learned more than 10 things, but 10 main categories that beginners want to know about how to get started with Photoshop CC. My name is Terry White. Thanks again for watching. Catch you next time.